Yeah, so um, I'm Kathy McDonald from AstraZeneca. I work in the uh, Medical Science Liaison Department, which is part of Medical Affairs. So I work on the non-promotional side, so providing scientific and technical support for our products. Um, so I hope I'm going to give you an objective um, view of the um, of Ticagrelor and the, the Plato data today. Um, so um, I'll give you a little bit of background about Ticagrelor, although some of that's now being covered, I think, in previous presentations. Talk to you about the overall results from PLATO, which is our pivotal phase three trial that led to the licensing of Ticagrelor, and then finish off looking at the subgroup, cabbage subgroup data from that, that study um, so that we can review that data. Okay, um, so just to re-emphasize that Ticagrelor is a distinct um, P2Y12 inhibitor compared to the other... Um, um, P2Y12 inhibitors on the market um, in that it is part of this um, CPTP chemical class rather than ethionopyridine. And um, as alluded to earlier, that conveys a number of different properties on the, um, the drug. First of all, it's orally active without the need for metabolic activation, and it does reversibly bind to the P2Y12 receptor, which potentially has some benefits in terms of um, recovery of platelets uh, when you stop therapy. And it's also a very complete inhibitor of platelet aggregation. And Analogous to the new, the new um, thionopyridine prasugrel, uh, both which are superior in that respect to uh, clopidogrel. Um, this is a quick overview here, then, of a, or a summary of the Plato study design. Um, and the things we need to point out to you were, again, it's a large, a large trial, 18,000 patients. It's a head-to-head -head for superiority of ticagrelor versus clopidogrel on a background of aspirin therapy. Um, Patients were randomized into the trial within 24 hours of their cardiac um, symptoms, and it was an all-comers, effectively, ACS trial. So it included STEMI patients, N-STEMI patients, and also unstable angina patients. Um, randomization occurred before there was any planned or urgent PCI, um, so before angiography was, um, uh, was done and, and anatomy was known. And patients could have received open-label clopidogrel right up until um, the randomization into the trial. So it's trying to reflect practice of, of what might happen to a patient when they, when they come in um, with an ACS. They may be loaded with clopidogrel um, before they were randomized into the trial. Um, the trial ran for up to 12 months. And the median time of patients in the trial was nine months. Um, in terms of doses, it's, each patient was loaded um, with the relevant dose of drug, 180 mg for ticagrelor, 300 mg for clopidogrel, or there was, there was an option to also um, increase that to 600 mg for the reasons that, that's been talked about before. I think about 20% of patients had 600 mg of clopidogrel. Um, and then obviously a standard maintenance dose, which is 75 mg once daily for clopidogrel and 90 mg twice daily for ticagrelor. So it is a twice daily drug. The primary endpoint was a composite of, of CV, death, MI, and stroke. So a fairly standard endpoint for these kinds of studies. Um, and this is the um, Kaplan-Meier estimates of the data up to 12 months um, for ticagrelor here in the purple and clopidogrel in the green. Um, the absolute event rates were 9.8% for ticagrelor and 11.7% for clopidogrel. So you see a 1.9% absolute risk reduction, which translates into a 16% um, relative risk reduction. And this was significant. So the study meant its primary endpoint. A couple of things just to notice about the curves as well is that they did take a few days to separate, um, but once they've started to separate, they continue to separate for the whole 12 months of the study. So there was um, additional benefit by staying on, on Ticagrelor for, for, the, for the full 12 months, and that's what the um, uh, license, recommend, um, license is for as well. As with all um, large studies like this, there's lots of secondary endpoints. And what I just wanted to draw attention to here are the individual components of the primary endpoint, end so MI, CV death, and stroke. Um, and if we just look here at the hazard ratios, you can see that the primary endpoint is driven by MI and CV death, both of which are significantly reduced, and that there is a numerical increase in stroke here that's not significant. The other um, endpoint just to, to mention is the total mortality here, um, which uh, showed a relative risk reduction of, of 22% and a nominally significant value here. I um, should just point out this is a hierarchical testing scheme to overcome the multiplicity associated with the large number of endpoints. So that's the um, efficacy endpoints. Um, I'll talk a little bit now about the bleeding associated with ticagrelor. 
So the primary safety, uh, sorry, yeah, primary safety endpoint was total major bleeding. And as again discussed earlier, there's no absolute, um, there's no significant difference between the total major bleeding seen between the ticagrelor and the clopidogrel arms. We get a 4% increase that's uh, not significantly different. Um, when you look at this in a little bit more detail, um, you can also see that there's no increase in life-threatening or fatal bleeding or in fatal bleeding itself. However, there are some bleeding differences that are seen when you sort of start looking at different types of bleeding. Um, and here I've just got the um, data for when you split the total major bleeding into non-cabbage major bleeding and cabbage major bleeding. So if we just look at the Plato definitions here. Um, and you can see that cabbage plato major bleeding is not significantly different. It's numerically less in the ticagrelor arm, although it's not significant. But that the non-cabbage related major bleeding is increased in the ticagrelor arm, 4.5% um, versus 3.8%. And this is analogous um, to what's been seen in other um, trials, such as the Triton trial with um, Prazogrel, where there's also an increase in non-cabbage related major bleeding. But remember, there's no increase in, in life-threatening and fatal bleeding, or no increase in fatal bleeding. Um, and then before I go on and talk about the cabbage data, I just wanted to um, point out that, that, again, because it's a large study, there have been lots of different subgroup analysis of the study, um, and a few of these are shown here. Um, there was the planned invasive group, planned medically managed group, the Plato STEMI group, the cabbage group, which I'll talk about in a moment, a diabetes subgroup, etc. And what I want to just point out here is that in all of the analysis in all of these subgroups, the um, relative risk reduction and to a large extent the absolute risk reduction is very similar across the board. We're getting a similar, um, you know, round about the 0.8. Um, sorry, 20% reduction, relative re risk reduction. In, in, in outcomes. Um, some of these are significant and some of them aren't. Obviously, these subgroups weren't powered to show um, significance, and what we're looking for is trends within these subgroups. That's for efficacy, and um, the same can be said also for the primary um, and primary safety endpoint um, here of total major bleeding. Again, there's no difference here, and this, this is the total major, not the non cabbage here. Okay, so that's a sort of, uh, sort of top line of all the, um, the total Plato data. Um, so what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just talk about the, the cabbage subgroup analysis here. And this is just the flow diagram which shows how, um, which patients have been included in this Plato um, cabbage sub-analysis. So of the 18,000 patients that were in Plato, about um, well, 1,899 patients had cabbage. Of those, 1,584 took study drug within the first and last, um, sorry, had a cabbage within the, la the first and last intake of study drug. And of those patients, 1,200 stopped therapy within seven days of surgery. And it's these 1,200 patients that have been the subject of the um, subgroup analysis with approximately 600 patients in each arm. A few slides now on baseline characteristics, and I'll just point out a few, um, a few points in these. So the average age, the, first of all, they were well matched between the two, the two arms of the study. Um, average age was 64, and about 15% of patients were over 75 years of age. Um, about 80% of patients were men. CV history is recorded here, and you can see that there was um, a significant CV history for a lot of the patients. Um, about 50% had had previous angina, about 20% um, MI, 10% um, had had a previous PCI, and 1% to 2% previous cabbage. Patients were also included in Plato if they had a previous TIA or stroke, or if they suffered from chronic renal disease, um, and that's true also in the Plato subgroup. In terms of renal disease, patients who were on dialysis were excluded, but all other patients were eligible to take part. Um, and here I just wanted to talk about the invasive procedures that were um, carried out in hospital. 90% uh, of patients had angiography. Some of the patients in this Plato subgroup had PCI, either within 24 hours of randomization or before discharge from hospital. And then 57, 56, 57% of patients had their cabbage while in hospital. Okay. Um, the um, subject of this analysis, as I said, was looking at um, days that um, study drug was stopped before cabbage. Um, and you can see there's actually a front loading of patients who stopped study drug with ticagrelor early um, compared to clopidogrel, and that's 
because of the anticipated faster offset of action of ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel. Um, you've seen this pl plot before, um, which just shows you the offset of action of, of, of ticagrelor. This is in stable patients, not ACS patients. And I just wanted to show that the, although the rate of offset is faster, it does take 72 hours, despite being a reversible drug, before we see a difference with um, ticagrelor, and, uh, ticagrelor over clopidogrel. Um, and then this is the data, this is the primary endpoint data for the um, cabbage subgroup, really showing you a similar trend um, to the overall study with a relative risk reduction of, 20, of 16%. It's not significant, but it wasn't powered to show this. Um, but what is also quite interesting is when you look at the individual components of the secondary endpoint, MICV death and stroke, where here you now see that the primary endpoint has been driven by reduction in mortality rather than by a combination of reduction in MI and CV death. And this tracks through also to all-cause mortality here. In terms of, um, just flick through those. Um, in terms of bleeding, um, just wanted to show you that, again, there is no significant um, difference between ticagrelor and clopidogrel in terms of various different breakdowns of cabbage-related bleeding, including total major bleed of cabbage-related major bleeding, life-threatening and fatal, and fatal bleeding. Um, and again, in, in terms of um, uh, blood transfusions that required, it's very similar between the two subgroups. And um, there's a test tube drainage output uh, stratified against days for the, for the different drugs. Okay, so if I just finish then by saying that um, in ACS patients undergoing cabbage within seven days of surgery, treated with either ticagrelor or, or clopidogrel, patients with ticagrelor exhibited an effect on the primary composite endpoint that was numerically consistent with the overall study with significantly fewer deaths, both CV and total, and there doesn't really seem to be an overall increase in cabbage-related breathing, either total or um, fatal as well. <laughs>